Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today, today's webinar hosted by HK45 and Young Istok. Um, I have uh, the pleasure to welcome a distinguished panel of, of speakers and also the president of Istok, which will start with a few words uh, on Istok. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Good, good afternoon and good morning to all. Um, I'm very pleased that Young Istak organized an event together with HK45. Today we have speakers and friends all the way from Hong Kong and everywhere. But Hong Kong is not very far any longer for us because we have our friend Gökçe there as our arbitration ambassador. And I am sure Istak and uh, Hong Kong arbitration um, uh, people will have quite often uh, common events together in future and we are very much looking forward to it. And as I always say, we are very proud of having young Istak here. There is a new arbitration generation coming in Turkey. Our young fellows are very interested in arbitration and also, and most importantly, very open-minded. Therefore, we believe the future of arbitration will be very promising in Turkey. Taking this opportunity one more time, I would like to thank all of you for organizing such a great event. And I wish you all enjoy this event today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Th then maybe uh, I think the next uh, would be Ezra and Tara who do the opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm the co-chair of Foreign Affairs Committee of Youngestak and a member of the executive committee. It's a great pleasure for us today to organize this event together with HK45. So without taking too much of your time, Following the nice introduction of Professor Kunji, I would like to just say a couple of words about Young Istak. Young Istak is a young forum group formed under Istak, and it's in fact uh, one of the first of its kind in Turkey, aiming to introduce and promote arbitration for younger professionals. Uh, since its establishment, Young Istak has organized numerous educational events, seminars, mood competitions, and engaged in partnerships uh, and cooperations with other young organizations like the one we are having today uh, with HK45. Today, uh, Young Stack has more than thousands of members and uh, in fact became the most popular uh, legal community for young professionals in Turkey. Membership to Young Stack is open to all young practitioners, uh, students, academicians from all around the world and the street. So we are very much looking forward that this number will even increase in the upcoming period. So now without taking too much of your time, I'd like to give the floor to my colleague, Tara Leo, who is a committee member of HK45. And she would like to also say a couple of words uh, about HK45. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isra. My name is Tara and it's my pleasure today to welcome you all on behalf of HK45. We are delighted to have so many of you with us and to be teaming up with our friends at Young Is That for this webinar. Uh, HK45, as you may know, is a group for young arbitration practitioners in Hong Kong and beyond. Uh, we're formed under the auspices of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. HK45 is very active in Hong Kong and in Asia Pacific. Uh, we have lots of events and skill training, including advocacy workshops and network opportunities and presentations from more senior practitioners. Uh, we are supported by a growing uh, network of regional ambassadors, including in mainland China, Singapore, uh, Switzerland, um, the UK, US, France, Germany, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, our original ambassadors are HK45's interface with the arbitration community in our respective host countries. 
um, HK45 membership is open to all, and we encourage you all to join. The details are available on our website, and please also follow us on LinkedIn. Um, without further ado, uh, I will now say a few words about our moderator, our very learned uh, friend, uh, Andreas uh, Schreckenberger. He's a Swiss lawyer, uh, and he works with the uh, Swiss arbitration boutique firm, um, Gabriel Arbitration in Zurich. He studied in the U.S. as a Fulbright scholar, and he worked in major arbitration firms in Vienna and Washington, D.C., with a very impressive international background. So now, without further ado, I'll just uh, hand it over to Andreas. Tara, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I also want to say a few uh, thank you words, in particular to HK45 and Young Istock for being open uh, to organize uh, this event, and in particular uh, Zelda as the president of Young Istock and Tara as an HK45 committee member. A special thanks goes also to uh, Luca Groseli from the Swiss law firm Schellenberg Wittmer in Zurich. He did a terrific job uh, in the background and without him, uh, today's event would not be possible. Uh, last but not least, I wanna thank Chloe for doing all the work in the background, uh, the importance of, of uh, uh, techniques and uh, that every, everything runs smooth is uh, more important today than ever. So uh, thank you very much for this. Um, a few remarks to the format and the topic of, of today's event. Uh, as you have seen, it's, it's an incredibly broad topic. So, so it, we had to, to break it down to a few key aspects, which we thought could be interesting for a majority of, of, of you, the audience, uh, if not all of you. Uh, so we will try to focus on key aspects. And in this regard, we have invited or tried, tried to, to bring in a, a diverse panel and each of the speakers has something to contribute, uh, which, is, which is very valuable in the context of uh, the Belt and Road in, uh, Initiative and disputes thereunder. Uh, to the format, uh, given that we have uh, five speakers and we have only about one hour, uh, we have decided to run this panel not in a classic format, where each of the speakers would initially have a, have a presentation on a selected topic, and then there would be a Q&A as a follow-up, uh, but rather to, to have a round table discussion uh, to, uh, in the hope that we can dive more quickly into the really interesting questions. Um, one further comment, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, depending on the definition, uh, covers, covers uh, 70 to 150 countries. So obviously we also here, we had to, to uh, have a clear focus. So we, we will mainly talk about uh, the jurisdictions of China uh, and Turkey. Uh, and China obviously as the creator of the Belt and Road Initiative, if I'm not wrong in 2013, is, 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 is very important uh, to understand the legal system there and the legal requirements. And Turkey on the other side of the Asian continent uh, is a key player in, in the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's also interesting to see uh, seven to eight years later how, how it is perceived in, in the Turkish arbitration market. So as a, as a very rough roadmap, the, the, the topics, the, the key aspects we think could be interesting for you is, uh, is first uh, mediation, combined mediation and arbitration proceedings. Mediation has become more and more popular these days and uh, not only because of the Singapore Convention, but also because many arbitration, uh, arbitration centers have inaugurated new mediation rules or even combined med, med arb rules as the ESTOC, and, and this will be discussed uh, later on. Then second, enforcement, uh, in particular enforcement in China is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting uh, topic. And uh, we also wanna check whether some potential prejudices about difficult enforcement in China is justified, or if, if, if uh, as it, it is true with so many prejudices, it's, it's, not, it's not true. Um, also in this regard, we will look into it whether uh, we should actually look at enforcement 
and not only at, at when the final award is rendered, but very early on when we draft the, the, the commercial contract or the arbitration clause. So that could also be uh, something which is practically relevant. Then third interim relief, uh, we will try to check what is the best option? Uh, is it going to state courts or to emergency arbitration? And how is the situation in investment arbitration? Uh, is it even 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 uh, realistic to to ask for interim relief against the state-owned entity? Then, if we have time, we will also look at some also critical questions on third-party funding. Is it is it uh, really is it helping uh, for access to justice? But is it also helping to to achieve a commercially reasonably reasonable result for the party who uh, engages the third party funder. Okay, then as Chloe already uh, or as we said, uh, there will be a networking uh, opportunity at five past one Istanbul time and five past six Hong Kong time. So uh, we will really try to, to stick to the schedule. And I also understand that this is the eve of the Chinese New Year. So I, I, I understand when everyone is a bit getting impatient uh, after one hour. So we will make our best at, uh, to stick to the schedule. Okay, the next, the next uh, uh, will be, I have the honorable task to introduce uh, our five speakers. Um, I would like to start with Zelda. As I already mentioned, she's the president of Young Eastock. And I think uh, already quite for quite some time. So she's, a, she's an important figure uh, in the young arbitration generation, uh, Professor Rakin, she mentioned at the beginning. And uh, she has, uh, she's a Turkish qualified lawyer and she holds also an LLM degree from the Galatasaray University where she uh, also focused on, on foreign awards. How are they treated on the Turkish arbitration law? She has uh, already 10 years uh, experience in arbitration, and I think one of her focus points is commercial, uh, sorry, construction disputes. And after these 10 years, uh, Zelda, uh, I understand she, she decided to take the plunge and to, to open her own boutique firm. Uh, and and uh, I, yeah, uh, we appreciate a lot that you found time uh, because I understand this, is, this can be challenging to, to start a new <laughs> boutique. So thank you very much for being here. Next one is Burke. Burke, um, uh, I asked Burke to to give me three highlights, uh, but it's it's uh, with Burke it's really difficult to, to just say three three things because he has already done a lot and, and a lot of qualifications. So I will try to to focus on three, but maybe it's a bit more. So Burke is a dual qualified lawyer uh, on one hand in England and Wales, and on the other hand in Turkey. Um, Education-wise, he was in the first class of the famous MITS uh, in, in Geneva. And he has also a PhD degree from Cambridge. Uh, his thesis was, uh, was entitled Judicial Acts and Investment Treaty Arbitration. And he won the ICC Inst Institute Prize in 2017 for that. Um, Burke is an associate professor at uh, Galatasaray University, where he teaches basically everything which is relevant for arbitration and commercial disputes. So uh, international investment law uh, and arbitration, international commercial disputes and private international law. He's also an arbitration partner at the Turkish boutique firm, Yuxel. Uh, right. Then Gökçe. Uh, Gökçe uh, has a uh, particular position today because on one hand she has a Turkish background and the other hand she's a deputy counsel at HKIC in Hong Kong. So we're very glad to have you here and have, a, have a, also the institutional perspective uh, of the HKIC, which we will later see has a very uh, special position under the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and when it comes to disputes they're under. Um, Gökçe has a bachelor degree from Istanbul University and an LLM degree from Georgetown uh, in Washington DC. Uh, she gained uh, arbitration experience in law firms in, uh, in Washington DC and Istanbul. And 
uh, sorry. Right. So as I said, we, will, we are very grateful to have you here. And Stella, Stella is a Hong Kong qualified <laughs> solicitor. Uh, she's a senior consultant with, with Herbert Smith Freehills in Beijing. Uh, she has uh, also an international uh, education background. She studied in the UK, in China, and in Hong Kong. And uh, she, uh, in her, additionally to her mandate work, she also does some pro bono work and also teaches some English and, and, and piano. Derek uh, is the fifth uh, speaker. Uh, he's a Singapore qualified lawyer. Uh, he specializes in uh, commercial and investment arbitration and sports arbitration. Um, he's a council member of the Law Society of Singapore and advocates for the rights and welfare of junior lawyers. Um, Derek will have uh, the quite difficult task to always bring in the investment law perspective. And it's clear that in this very time, a uh, short time frame, he will uh, probably only uh, be able to do that on a high level perspective, but that this is absolutely fine. And maybe with Stella, uh, what I also wanted to mention, Stella has uh, uh, extensive experience uh, with Chinese parties and also about the, the legal uh, environment in China. So that will a bit uh, be her role in, in this uh, panel discussion. Okay, so I think I have talked uh, now uh, enough for the time. So let us get started with the topic as such. And we, like when we start the discussion, normally we, we need to know what we even talk about. So when, when, when we think about the Belt and Road Initiative and, and in the context of disputes and arbitration, uh, what, 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 uh, would you, what comes to mind? Uh, Stella, please, if you could start. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, and then hi, everyone. Um, first, the question, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, when people ask me what is Belt and Road Initiative, sometimes I say I really don't exactly know what it is. It is a very big initiative by the Chinese government. I think the core is that with that initiative, Chinese investment, um, both from the public sector and the private sector, um, do go outside of China, invest in a lot of projects, which is in foreign countries. The Belt and the Road is a symbol. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the countries in that belt or in that road. Um, it, it's a general symbol for there will be a lot of ch investment from China, either it's from the government or public sector or from the private sector, and then dealing with a lot of projects in foreign countries. And then when I look at the government page of the Belt and Road Initiative, I realized, and Andrea, Andrea, Andreas reminded me that there has been like 140 countries also which has signed a memo with the Chinese government about this initiative. So take, today I took a look at one of these memos. So it's, all these memos are very, very high level. It's all principle based. And then the purpose and then the aim of these memos are which I quote, and is the two countries will cooperate in a lot of sectors, including infrastructure, manufacturer, agriculture technology, information technology, clean energy, and coordination in supervision in regulatory issues. So these are the areas very, very big. And initially, before I really prepare for this, my knowledge is very limited. Initially, I saw that. Um, a large part of Belt and Road was about infrastructure investment, but actually it could be extended to a lot of other things. So, um, so with that in mind, how does that impact, how does it relate to lawyers? So basically everything, every investment, every move in these projects needs legal support, whether initially it's the outbound investment, or it's the negotiation of all these concession agreements, and construction and, and agreement, EPC agreements, or any international trading agreements, or it's later in relation to how to resolve disputes arising from these agreements. So I guess that's the angle where disputes lawyer comes in, where, where especially international arbitration and investment treaty arbitration are important because these are all projects between parties from different countries 
and then involve assets and the money from different jurisdictions and involve a lot of parties. Um, arbitration are traditionally considered as a better way for dealing with international transactions because people are from parties are from different countries with different legal background and uh, culture. So this is a very brief understanding of Belt and Road Initiative for me. Thank you very much. It's, I think it's difficult to make it make it shorter. So thank you so much. Uh, Gökçe, from the from the HKIC perspective, uh, Hong Kong is, is right. I mean, it's part of, of the of China, even if it has a special status. Um, is it uh, how is it perceived the, the Belt and Road Initiative? And maybe can you also tell us if you know whether in the five five past five years you know, more or less since the initiation of the Belt and Road Initiative, if there is any, any change in the caseload. Sure, Andreas. Uh, from 2016 to the middle of 2020, we have registered more than 900 arbitrations involving a BRI state. And I think it's quite significant to note that there were more than 2,000 parties involved from 42 different jurisdictions. So these numbers are demonstrating our caseload. If we focus on BRI projects particularly, it's a challenging task to identify the disputes considering the undefined scope of the initiative and limited data on the terms, size and number of the investments. Uh, but for the purposes of this event, we have identified 95 arbitrations, uh, one party is from mainland China, and the other one is from a BRI state. And the total number in dispute is, I think, approximately 2 billion USD. As to the second part of your question, uh, whether uh, how the caseload was perceived, and I can say also that we see uh, parties from Turkey to Laos Luxembourg to Malaysia, but given the scope of the initiative, we see the majority of parties from mainland China. And as I mentioned, we have identified 95 arbitrations. Uh, and in these 95 arbitrations, there were nine arbitrations involving mainland Chinese state-owned entities or its affiliates. This may all sound abstract numbers. So let me give you an example of a BRI related dispute. In an arbitration administered by HKIC, the claimant was a Cayman entity of a Chinese state-owned entity. Respondents were a, an African SOE, a Hong Kong company, and a special purpose vehicle company from Cayman Islands. The dispute was in relation to a loan, uh, in, in relation to a loan arising out of a Chinese state-owned entities investment in three oil blocks of an African state, and the amount in dispute was around 1.4 billion USD. Considering HKIC's independency from governments and expertise in the BRI uh, projects and mainland Chinese parties, we expect these numbers to grow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you also know how much in, in, in the HKIC, how much Chinese parties you have approximately, generally, how much the, in, in, how many, if you register all the parties you have, which are involved under the HKIC rules, the administered ones, how much Chinese parties do you have? Do you have any idea? Uh, I do not have the full number uh, about pending cases involving mainland Chinese entities. But I can say that we released the statistics yesterday with respect to our caseload in 2020. And as far as I can see, there were, I do not have that information with me at the moment, but there is a press release that you can access through our website. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, then let's quickly turn to Turkey. How is, the, how is the Belt and Road Initiative perceived in Turkey? I mean, uh, five, about five, five to seven years after it was initiated, uh, do you see anything which changes or, or was, was China, for instance, always was traditionally already uh, an important 
trade partner of, of Turkey. Zelda, uh, what do you think? Thank you, Andreas. Like uh, the caseload was not dramatically increased uh, since we already know on first the projects then the disputes. So we are the, in the projects part right now, I think. Um, but the BRI has affected the Turkish market, especially the investments. Uh, there's a lot of uh, investments in Turkey late years and also uh, lots of Chinese parties appointed Turkish lawyers and lots of Chinese parties appointed Turkish arbitrators as their arbitrators. So um, in these years, it was a, a great impact on the investment and we believe this was this is going to continue with the arbitration cases and uh, it's going to be a big advantage for the Turkish arbitration market and, of course, ISTAC, since it's a newly established um, and independent um, international arbitration center in Turkey, and it has a very strategic advantage. So I think for the investment part, it was a, a good impact, but it's going to be a better impact in the arbitration market in the future years. Okay. So... Uh, it seems like it, it's uh, interesting for a, it could be interesting for a Chinese investor to to invest in Turkey, uh, but we also have, of course, to look at, at the legal environment. So, um, if you ha had to advise a, a, a Chinese general contractor or, or an investor and and uh, and has Turkish counterparties to deal with, mm -hmm. uh, Burke, what would you say are the biggest benefits of the arbitration law? Or, or arbitration environment in Turkey. Um, thank you, Andreas. Um, maybe, maybe I can start with you know the basic background um, uh, information, which is the fact that Turkish arbitration law is based on ancestral model law. Um, so that's just a point of reference. Um, an important advantage that I would see uh, it's. From a practical perspective, uh, it's, I would say, easier to hold uh, hearings in Turkey logistic-wise. Um, this especially concerns when you come, uh, when you have witnesses coming from uh, different countries in the world and, you know, visa requirements. Sometimes it could be challenging in uh, continental Europe, UK or US, uh, whereas, you know, the, the visa requirements in Turkey Earn that much. The time difference that for the time difference, Turkey is, is I would say, rather closer uh, to Asia. So uh, it could be also a benefit when, when compared to you know the uh, UK, which is like now three hours in summer, two hours difference. Um, that could be maybe a practical advantage. I don't know. Um, another important issue is that um, the case law. Uh, concerning arbitration is evolving and Turkey is becoming more and more arbitration friendly each year. Um, and I would say ISTAC played in a huge important role uh, in this evolution. Uh, it's, it, it, it's playing a, a, the role of a, a soft power. Um, it's, you know, it gets in touch with, you know, with practitioners, with judges and tries to solve uh, the problems, uh, the problems in the practice. Uh, and another important maybe role of ISTAC is that it has become an, a quite an innovative uh, arbitration center with, you know, a different set of uh, rules on new, uh, new aspects like MEDARP or uh, the virtual hearing uh, protocol. Um, so I would say, you know, it's, Turkey is becoming more uh, reliable country in terms of arbitration. Um, and those were the initial points of reference that I could make in favor. In Maybe in this favor, uh, I can say that, as I said, like case law is evolving, but um, Turkish courts had traditionally been a bit more skeptical. It's becoming less and less uh, skeptical, but sometimes you can see uh, some judgments that are not that much in favor, uh, of course. Um, like one of them is that um, uh, like there is a, a, a law um, uh, from 1926, I guess, uh, which requires contracts to be done in Turkish. Uh, and if it's not done in Turkish, uh, sometimes the, 
uh, Turkish courts uh, interpret that you know uh, this contract is invalid, including the arbitration clause. Um, and um, as you know, lawyers know that they generally prepare a dual column uh, uh, contract. So the solution is simple. Uh, but um, you know, I, I hope that you know uh, Turkish courts uh, would would you know. Um, interpret the law otherwise, um, you know, it's, it would be better. But anyway, uh, the Turkish uh, court's approach is evolving. So it's uh, becoming, uh, I would say, more, more and more arbitration friendly. Uh, good, yeah, let's hope some of the Turkish judges, they also listen to our, web, uh, watch our webinar. Maybe they, <laughs> it helps also a bit to influence, take influence. Uh, Derek, um, uh, what, just, just to briefly, maybe from a very high level perspective, when you think of disputes uh, against states or SOEs, what, are, what, what challenges usually you face or what are the, the biggest challenges you can think of on the top of your head? Thanks, Andreas. I think the greatest difficulty when you're an investor going up against the state is simply the fact that the state has more resources than you. This is what I would call a resource asymmetry between the parties. Now, if you're a small investor and you've just been had your assets expropriated by uh, the state, it's quite likely that you wouldn't have enough resources to fight a long and protracted legal battle with the state. So naturally, the state has the advantage over there. And not only in terms of resources, states also have access to various uh, organs of the state. For example, they have the access to the military, the police, and all that when they expropriate the assets. And so sometimes when you find that the assets have been expropriated, you know, just the next day, you simply just can't enter into the building that's been surrounded by police or military. And so the, the fact that there's a resource asymmetry also lends itself to creating an information asymmetry. So investors often have an uphill task in terms of gathering enough information or gathering enough witnesses to launch a claim against an investor because if the building's already surrounded by guards and you can't enter into a building to collect uh, or retrieve uh, evidence and documents that might be useful for a case, you know, your case is not going to be that strong. And the fact that in some of the more volatile regions uh, where investor state arbitration claims have occurred, while well, states might have re resort to um, simply arresting some of these potential witnesses. And for some of the other witnesses who've yet to be uh, arrested, you know, they might be very reluctant understandably so in terms of uh, stepping forward and providing that testimony for the arbitration because at the best of times what could happen is that they might lose their job you know they might have no future in the state you know and the worst of it you know they might sometimes be incarcerated or even lose their lives so this is a quite a serious problem uh, that investors sometimes will have to grapple with when they go up against the state in investor state arbitration i see okay so so when I, when I understand there is a particular challenge is the fact finding, the fact finding and, and actually evidence. So, so would it be maybe a practical advice that, that, that investors would look from the beginning that, you know, also the, uh, to have the document, a documentary evidence already just, just in case there is a dispute? Or can you even, or, or can you think of a practical tip how you, how you tackle this, this issue? Andres, I think that's a great suggestion. So some of the times where we've encountered a lack of access to documents, a lot of it could actually have been prevented if, you know, for example, if they stored it on an internet uh, you know, cloud, you know, where it could be accessed from other jurisdictions. So that could resolve some of the issues when it comes to documentary evidence. But I think a lot of the times in arbitration, witness testimony is actually of a greater weight and help uh, than a lot of documents. So that is still one hurdle that we need to think about uh, grappling with because from uh, my experience, you know, I've encountered uh, in investor state arbitration, witnesses who have the, um, got the, received the courage to step forward to testify. And you know, th they are really in fear of their lives. I recall there was one incident where one of the witnesses uh, at the arbitration refused to you know, eat any of the food that was offered uh, to her because she was so afraid of uh, being poisoned <laughs> by uh, the state that was involved in the arbitration. And, you know, and, and that didn't help uh, her performance in the arbitration. So as a result of that, we actually had to, you know, each of us had to eat the food in front of her in order to uh, uh, assure her that, you know, there was nothing uh, wrong with the food.
That's, that's an impressive, impressive story, yeah, example. Okay, um, in the, as I met, in the, in the interest of time, uh, I suggest we move on to the next uh, topic, which is combined mediation and arbitration. And um, I heard that ISTAC announced very new uh, MedArb rules. And uh, Zelda, if you would have to market this, this ISTAC MedArb rules or, uh, you know, to, uh, to advise a, a Chinese investor in Turkey, what, what, what would you say? Um, ISTEC announced its MEDAP rules on 15th of November uh, in 2019. Uh, it's fairly new. And um, I think Dr. Demirkol can mention about more because he was uh, participating in the procedure while the rules was preparing. Uh, but lately um, in Turkey, for some disputes, especially the commercial and employment disputes, there is a mandatory mediation. So the mediation becomes very popular between the lawyers. And always it was a big question in Turkey uh, in the seminars, like do arbitration and mediation friends or rivals? Like it, it, it has been asked several times, if I choose arbitration, it, it doesn't mean I cannot go to mediation. It was a big uh, question in the minds. I think this matter of system uh, solely itself answered to these questions. Uh, in this system, uh, it supports each other, the mediation and arbitration supports each, each other and it minimizes their advantages, like the time and efficiency. So um, I promote East Tax Medap rules because it's an independent and expert uh, arbitration center. And I believe um, applying to mediation can shorten the procedure sometimes. It can prolong sometimes too, but mostly it can um, save time. So uh, I believe the MedArp rules will be very popular between the um, companies, especially because they, uh, they respect the time efficiency and especially cost efficiency very much. It's, it's very um, important for them to receive an award or a decision quickly and cost efficiently. So I believe MedArp will help this system. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, you you uh, you would say that generally in international contracts, it would be good to, to have a to have a MedArp system in place. So at least a two tier mechanism, because you believe that the parties sometimes can can find a resolution of the dispute by mediation, and, and the parties should give be given a chance. Yes, that... because yeah, sometimes in our arbitration cases, parties get an uh, agreement after the RFA is submitted or maybe after the answer to RFA because they see it's going something somewhere serious. So I believe sometimes mediation can uh, shock them like saying that it's going somewhere serious. So just sit and <laughs> agree on something. So it may shorten the procedure uh, in some cases, but sometimes if they can't agree, of course it can prolong it too. But I don't think it will have a big eff uh, effect because it's not a very long procedure. So I think it's better to give it a try. Okay. It's, it's, it's interesting because also that is a very, very positive uh, use of, of the ISTOC MEDARB rules. But I understand that actually the background of the, the introduction of the MEDARB rules uh, could, be, could be a reason which is uh, founded in the, in the Turkish domestic civil litigation system. And maybe Burke, do you, as, as one of the drafters of the of the ISTAC MEDAB rules, uh, what do you say? Uh, well, um, yeah, you're right. Well, ISTAC MEDAB rules um, may be uh, the, the driven force uh, behind it was uh, the fact that it became compulsory in Turkey uh, for commercial litigations to go to mediation. So if you have a commercial uh, court case, uh, you have to first go to mediation and then you can initiate uh, the, uh, the, commercial, uh, the commercial claim uh, before a Turkish court. Uh, it's, uh, that was introduced, if I'm not wrong, in, in the beginning of 2019. Um, and uh, and uh, so at this mediation, uh, and the Turkish experience with mediation was uh, unexpectedly uh, useful or productive because like I would say, I think 
I, I may be wrong in numbers, but I think at least 30, 40 percent of the disputes are resolved now uh, through mediation. So mediation has been quite successful. But even if it's not successful, at that point, at that juncture, uh, parties sit around the table and they can at least discuss uh, if they they wanna they want to um, proceed with the dispute. They they can discuss how to do it more efficient. At that point, they can discuss the adoption of arbitration as a mechanism. So this requires uh, may, maybe it's not a classic MedArb system. Uh, this one because you you just make an arbitration agreement at that point, not a MEDARP uh, agreement, but it requires kind of a regula regulation of some problematic parts. Uh, well, at least some parts that could be problematic in future, like who, who can be appointed as, a, as an arbitrator? Would it be possible to appoint the mediator as an arbitrator? Uh, if one of the parties had good, uh, Good experience with one of those mediators. Would it be possible for that arbitrate uh, for that party to appoint uh, the uh, the mediator who just saw the dispute? So you need concrete, solid rules um, uh, suggesting yes or no uh, to those to those questions. Uh, or another important question would be: you know, there will be some uh, correspondence. Um, uh, or some documents revealing uh, during the uh, uh, mediation uh, procedure. So it, it would be important to know whether those will be admissible in the arbitration proceeding. Um, but obviously, while drafting the MEDARP um, rules, uh, we had to look also the more classical uh, MEDARP uh, disputes as like Selda referred to, you, you just have a MEDARP clause in a construction uh, contract. Uh, you first initiate mediation and then uh, you go to arbitration. So there were also uh, like those aspects uh, in those rules. But I think primarily it was designed uh, uh, to attract cases from mediation. I see, Is the, can you let us know when, when, when are the MEDARP rules applicable? Are they, when, when there is an arbitration, let's say there is an arbitration clause uh, providing for stock arbitration, and there is a mediation, but the mediation cent no mediation center mentioned, would then the MEDARP rules already apply? Yes, uh, so long as you have a mediation beforehand and the arbitration is heard in ISTAC, MEDARP rules applies. Okay, so you have you have a purposefully made a broad broad mm -hmm. application, yeah. as a broad scope of application. Yeah, and, then exactly. you and then you mentioned something about it's important to, to uh, to provide rules, whether a mediator, the, also the mediator can later act in the arbitration. And can you briefly let us know what is the stance of, of ISTAC in this respect? Well, yeah, uh, so the mediator can act as an arbitrator if parties agree, uh, but unless parties agrees, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the default rule uh, under ISTAC MEDARP rules is that uh, parties cannot appoint uh, uh, mediators, either as, as president, sole arbitrator, or party appointed arbitrators. I see. Okay, I th I think actually this is this is uh, also many many uh, uh, arbitration rules also foresee this this who who uh, have rules on that or mediation rules. So HKIC is, is similar in that regard. Is the or can you Gökçe, can you tell us how the HKIC arbitration rules, or it would rather be maybe the mediation rules, then uh, uh, tackle this issue? Let's say that it would be a mix of rules. Uh, we welcome MEDAR scenarios under Article 13.8 of our arbitration rules. In according to this provision, an arbitration may be suspended if the parties would like to explore other means to settle their dispute. As we are a one-stop shop, uh, we provide mediation services for parties who would like to mediate their dispute. And in that, in, if that happens, then our mediation rules would be applicable. Well, there are often concerns with respect to whether a mediator can sit as an arbitrator as 
Berg described as well. So there are uh, provisions in our mediation rules to prevent uh, any violation of confidentiality or impartiality of arbitrators. And according to these provisions, for example, nothing that transpires in a mediation process can be used in a subsequent arbitration process. And at the same time, a mediator cannot sit as an arbitrator in the same dispute arising out of the same contract. Okay, um, Stella, I I understand. So I understand that uh, the the regulation of HKIC actually reflects uh, a, an important concept in in the common law world. It's the without pre prejudice concept. And maybe you can can you uh, elaborate uh, a bit on this concept and whether this concept has any significance in China. Uh, sure. Um, I, I think with the question of um, whether mediation can be part of the arbitration process, um, from what I understand, it's more a debated question in common law jurisdictions. The reason is that traditional in common law jurisdictions, um, arbitration as well as litigation are processes that the judges or the arbitrators should, should not hear party submissions in a mediation because the idea is that in a mediation or a genuine settlement discussion, the parties may make concession, they may admit some of the liabilities, and these are the things that they won't do in a proper arbitration and litigation proceedings. The judges or the arbitrators hearing these, the idea is that it might prejudice their decision on the facts and the legal issues for them to decide in an arbitration and litigation. This is why there is a rule under the common law jurisdictions, a procedural rule under the common law jurisdictions to protect um, communications for genuine purpose for settlement. And these, these communications are generally called without prejudice um, um, communications. And this means that these communications are not going to be exhibited or are going to be presented later at arbitration or litigation proceeding to an arbitrator or a judge. And the purpose is what I've said, prevent them from being prejudiced, um, from hearing these additional information that the parties wouldn't volunteer in an advers adversarial proceeding. And now why it has become a very heated debate in, in say for you know, Hong Kong, and there is a case in 2011 in Hong Kong about enforcing an an arbitral award rendered by Xi'an Arbitration Commission in China. And in that case, in, in that case, what happened was that actually NetArb and ArbMed is very popular in China because China is a civil law system. Mediation is always accepted in the litigation proceedings and arbitration proceedings. And then a judge and an arbitrator can, can generate with, without any difficulties being, being a mediator in a proceeding. And in that case, what happened was that and the tribun tri one tri uh, tribunal member had a dinner with one of the parties and uh, during the parties, which they discussed about the case and then uh, without the presence of the other party. And then when the other party find out after the award was delivered, it challenges in the Hong Kong court when, um, when a party enforces it in Hong Kong and saying that it's against the public policy. And for the first, this, this case is called the Gao Hai Yan versus Qinai, and then it's in 2011. If people are interested, you can check it. For the first instance decision, the, the enforcement was refused on the public policy and uh, on the basis of the tribunal was biased because traditionally we think that a tribunal member cannot have one side conversation with just one party. Um, actually, for the Court of Appeal decision, it, it reversed the first of um, court of first instance decision on the basis that the, the, the court of appeal didn't find a, a apparent bias by that arbitrator because because the um, but the party was saying that the arbitrator was genuine conduct conducting a mediation during a dinner. So that was a very heated deba debate in Hong Kong, and then where in in the new re reform of Hong Kong arbitration ordinance, it's, it's no longer new now. So the uh, Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance was reformed in 2008, um, 2011. And then Section 33 has expressly allowed uh, mediation processes taking place in the arbitration proceedings, which given the 
legal kind of um, regime support and having mediation pro proceedings um, in the arbitration process. Now we come back to the ESPEC and mediation rules. I think the key point is that with these mediation rules, if the parties agree with it, it means that if, if the party also agrees that your arbitrating or arbitration can act as a mediator, then it no, no longer become an issue at the later stage for challenge that arbitral award because, and these are all based on the parties agreement and then you can't really raise that and at the enforcement stage as a ground for refusing enforcement i think that's the key of um of these these kind of rules and then that's how how the the involvement of the rules help um dealing with all these com um, controversial issues okay right right um with the specificity that actually the the stock rules are actually quite similar like the HKIC rules. So basically the ESTAC rules would not allow it. They, would, they only allow it when the par party specifically agree, agreed to that. And that then it would also be fulfilled what you said and they kind of waive uh, probably any possibility to challenge the award on that basis later. Um, Derek, you have nodded your head about when, when Stella uh, explained that maybe on the common law uh, th there is a stricter concept and the, the, the mediator, also the mediator should in no way act later in the arbitration. Do you have any, anything to add in this regard, maybe also in, in uh, respect to the disputes against states or is it the same, uh, is it the same issue? Thanks Andreas. I think what Stella mentioned about the common law perspective regarding whether a mediator can then be the same arbitrator in the arbitration, I think holds quite true. Because um, in my personal experience, I've not encountered any investment arbitrations either in the treaties or in contracts which provided for uh, a mad up procedure because uh, there are several, several difficulties with that. Because first of all, uh, a good mediator might not be a good arbitrator and likewise a good arbitrator might not be a good mediator. And so having the same person to double hat two of these roles might be counterproductive for the settlement of the dispute. I think another issue which comes to my mind in this sort of mad art procedure is that uh, I immediately see an opportunity to challenge the uh, partiality and bias of the arbitrator. Uh, so for example, if, an, if the mediator uh, has, uh, during the course of mediation, shown a certain preference for a party's case or a party's position, and you know, it then goes on to an arbitration, then you know the party who feels that he might have been prejudiced by that mediator may then lodge a challenge against the arbitrator for uh, impartiality for partiality and for biasness. And I see that there is possibly a common law and civil law divide in terms of the uh, perception of this, because I understand from the uh, German arbitration rules, the uh, DIS at the, uh, I believe it's Annex C, it actually provides and allows the arbitrator to give a preliminary assessment of the arbitration before they even move on in order to promote the settlement of the dispute. Now, this seems to be perhaps you know, common sense for civil lawyers, but to common lawyers, when we hear of this, we immediately think about the possibilities of challenging of biasness because uh, at the preliminary assessment, the arbitrator would have to say uh, which, party has the, uh, it, which party has a stronger case. And to us, you know, as common lawyers, we may see that as a ground for us to uh, challenge him for biasness and all that. But I understand from speaking to um, civil lawyers, such as uh, uh, Mr. Peter Heck, uh, Heckle, who wrote the uh, DIS rules, he tells me that in this regard, in practice, it's very, very rare for any challenge to occur as a result of this preliminary assessment. So I like to think that there's possibly a divide between uh, the civil law tradition, the common law tradition, when it comes to MEDA procedures, as Stella has already mentioned, it's a very popular uh, procedure in, uh, in China. So I think it, that might po possibly be the case that it's just a matter of a different legal tradition viewing it. Right. And, and still we can see that, that the ESTOC actually follows the same, same approach as, as the common law, which, which, which is interesting. Uh, right. Um, I see now that we have only about 10 minutes left for the rest <laughs> of the panel. So I, I suggest we, we uh, address enforcement 
as, as the next topic. And then maybe Stella, can you give us a brief, a brief uh, background? Uh, how easy is it to enforce foreign arbitral awards in China? Yeah. And uh, yeah, what, what I said in the beginning, is there a pre prejudice maybe which is not justified? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, understand. Um, China traditionally, if, if you think, if you think about arbitration friendly jurisdictions, I don't think China is the first jurisdiction that comes to your mind. Like traditionally, we think England or Paris and, and Swiss and Swiss, these countries, Hong Kong, Singapore, these are countries that are very, very arbitration friendly. And then um, by all means, the court will enforce and for reinforcement and for foreign arbitral award. Actually, China has made a very big improvement in the past 10 to 15 years to recognize and enforce um, foreign New York Convention, uh, New York Convention awards. Um, you may have he heard that um, in China there is an internal, in the court there is an internal reporting system. How does it work is that a New York Convention was adopted in China in, in 19, if I remember correctly, it's 1995. And then after that, there is an internal reporting system introduced in China, which means that if a local court is minded to refuse enforcement of a foreign award, it has to, it can't deliver the judgment by itself. It has to report to its superior, superior court. And if the superior court is also minded, they have to report all the way to the um, um, Supreme People's Court. It's only the Supreme People's Court agrees that this is a award to be uh, refuse to in enforce, then the local court can deliver a judgment saying that I refuse to ref refuse to enforce it. So every single refuse to enforcement precedent is actually vetted by the Supreme People's Court. All the Supreme People's Court judge judges have considered about it. So I have looked at the quick statistics. Um, for all the Hong Kong rendered our arbitral award until July 2000. 20 last year, there are only nine cases which has been refused enforcement in China. Consider how big the caseload of HKIC every year, hundreds and thousands of cases every year. This is a very small percentage. So I think, I think the, there, there might, China is, which I say that it's not the first tier, like arbitral, safe or arbitral friendly country because the legal region, which is Chinese arbitration law, was back in two thousand, was enacted in two thousand uh, nineteen ninety five, which is very outdated, and it doesn't have the modern rules, and uh, to take into into consideration a lot of international arbitration issues, and it's really outdated. That's why, and then it's not um, on model law based, so that's why generally it's not considered as that an um, arbitration friendly jurisdiction but in terms of enforcement we do have a very high uh, rate of enforcement and if you think other enforcement issues about oh whether there is local protection whether you can whether there is any way to find the assets whether the respondent will dissipate assets i think these are the risks that uh, all the parties face in all enforcement cases no matter it's a domestic enforcement cases no matter it's an enforcement judgment or award so these should not be taken into consideration as a specific disadvantage if you want to enforce in China. Okay, very, very good. You mentioned you mentioned some that, that China has not maybe the most modern arbitration law. What what would be maybe surprises uh, for someone about the, uh, can you give a few examples? Which, mm -hmm. What could be surprising about the arbitration law in China? Um, so the arbitration law in China China, which and I said that it was in, in incorporated in 1995. That was way before China op really opened up and developing its economy, and way before Belt and Road. And uh, so, in that arbitration law, it doesn't envisage that arbitration could be international. So, say for example, there is a big debate about whether foreign institutions, including HKIC, can uh, administer as uh, uh, an arbitration seated in China. Uh, mainland China. Uh, that's a huge debate. It doesn't mean that, okay, if you end up having these kind of clauses, you can't arbitrate in China. It doesn't practically, it doesn't mean like, like that. It just means that your arbitration clause and then your award rendered according to that arbitration clause might face a challenge in the future. 
Um, and then also there is a restriction in China saying that only foreign related disputes are allowed to have, um, uh, have arbitrations administered by foreign institutions. So if you are two domestic companies having a dispute between each other, you can only arbitrate in China. And domestic companies can be a foreign invested woofy. So they can be a China incorporated company, but actually it's ultimate, ultimate controller and ultimate shareholder is a foreign entity. So actually in nature, it's a foreign party, but actually it's just a Chinese entity. But if you have a contract between these two, it might be that your only choice is to arbitrate in China. So these are the specific kind of things that the Chinese arbitration rules or Chinese arbitration laws kind of limits. We're still waiting for the next update of the arbitration law. Before the law updates and the reforms, there are still these inherent restrictions there, which um, foreign parties have to navigate with very good um, PRC law advice. Okay, that's very interesting. So, so actually we have the Belt and Road Initiative is, is, is relatively recent maybe seven years uh, since, and, and the, the arbitration law is from 95. So there is maybe a bit a, a bit of dissymmetry and maybe the arbitration law uh, could could use a bit uh, modernization. That's what I what I take. Then, then Zelda, you, yes. <laughs> Zelda, you have uh, particular knowledge about enforcement of arbitral awards in, in Turkey. And we have one question here in the Q&A. The, uh, the question is how national courts of Turkey support enforceability of the awards issued on the MEDARB rules. Maybe can you, how can you answer to that? I don't have any specific experience about MEDARB rules since it is newly established, but maybe Dr. Demirko has any, he can uh, participate. <laughs> I don't have any specific one about MEDARP rules. Okay. Well, I can, um, sorry. Please, please, Burke. Uh, yeah, uh, so what, what I could, like, it, well, the judgment or awards at the end of the MEDARP, uh, well, not judgment, sorry, uh, the, the decision of, like, like the settlement agreement uh, between the parties or the award, at the end of the day, it's a settlement agreement or an award. So MEDARP proceeding, ends up either with a settlement or an arbitral award. And the enforcement of an arbitral award is just the same than any arbitral award. Uh, and the settlement uh, is just the same than any other settlement. Uh, well, maybe settlement following a mediation could have different rules than uh, settlements through a non-mediation uh, procedure. But at the end of the day, it, it combines two existing system and the outcome is either one or the other. So there is no really MEDARP specific enforcement mechanism. There could be only maybe some, some grounds for annulments, like other grounds of annulment, like if you have a MEDARP and if you initiate arbitration without going mediation, uh, would it be a problem uh, would, or would, it, would the tribunal, would the award be uh, annulled, et cetera. There could be specific questions like that. But at the end of the day, you have either an arbitral award or a settlement. So uh, the enforcement shouldn't be uh, like a separate system. Okay, that, that's very helpful. There may be the second question uh, here in the Q&A. They ask whether in Belt, Belt and Road contracts, um, uh, whether contracts often include dispute boards and maybe Zelda, since you have a lot of experience in construction disputes. It has been used in FIDIC contracts for several year, years. The DABs, now DAABs right now. Uh, these have been using for several years right now. And I don't, I think I have never seen a contract excluding the DAB part because it's been very useful. Uh, the only problem is if one of the parties gives a dissatisfaction notice at the end of a DB procedure, then uh, it means lots of time. But uh, usually the parties tend to um, apply these um, decisions. So I think it would be effective to add these, if, especially if it's a dispute uh, of construction, like a construction contract. And if I, if they are using a FIDIC, I think uh, FIDIC signed an 
protocol for the BRI um, projects. So if you're using FIDIC, uh, you should keep the dispute board clause um, in order to maybe uh, resolve the dispute without going to the arbitration in a very shorter time because the timeframes of the ABs are um, written in the contract and they're very uh, limited, like 64 days and etc. So it would be a time efficient way to resolve the dispute. Okay, okay, very good. Um, I, I hear we can continue uh, for five, about five more minutes. Um, maybe Stella, um, do you have any thoughts on enforcement, whether we have, uh, we should actually not only think about enforcement issues when the final award is rendered, but already at the drafting stage of the, the commercial contract or the clause? Mm, mm, enforcement issues at the drafting stage, I, I think um, obviously choosing a very arbitration friendly seat is very important. Um, everybody says that um, you have to choose a new New York convention seat, but New York convention seat is a starting point. It doesn't necessarily mean that 190 jurisdictions, which are New York convention states, it's easy to enforce your award in these states. There are always difficulties about local laws. So uh, an arbitration friendly seat is very, very important because these seats, the court system and their arbitration region, their laws um, and safeguards um, the 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 uh, the the streamless um, process and then the, the principles that um, arbitral award by an arbitral tribunal should be enforced without challenging the merits of the award. So I think that's the most important part. But uh, but obviously contractual negotiation of an arbitration clause is always like the other contractual negotiation. It depends on your bargaining power. So if you, you ask me like what is the most important element in an arbitration clause that you need to Safeguard, I think a safe seat is very, very important. If you need to lose the other things that because of your your lack of bargaining power, then then stick your powers to the to a safe seat. Right. Okay, that that is helpful. Um Derek, do you think do you think enforcement uh, considerations should also play a role uh, in uh, in investment disputes or in investments against states? when you maybe choose between initiating a, an arbitration under the, the commercial arbitration clause and the treaty, the, the applicable bi bilateral investment treaty. Thanks, Andreas. I think what Stella mentioned about the uh, seat of the arbitration clearly is an important factor, but I think that might be a second order question. So the first order question would be whether you are able to bring a claim in the first place. So for example, in a commercial arbitration, you might have a contract with a, a party in that jurisdiction. But what has happened is that the state has expropriated your assets. So the commercial arbitration, uh, the arbitral clause there simply doesn't help you because it's not that other party which has uh, caused any uh, infringement of your rights or confiscated property of the state. So you have to go uh, by the treaty route against the state. Now, with the first order question out of the way, we now have to consider then the seat of the arbitration, because like what Stella has already mentioned, it affects the issues of setting aside and if it is a safe seat, for example, the usual jurisdiction, Singapore, Hong Kong, then likely that the award would not be set aside. And I think this is a tactical uh, decision that parties must make. If parties think that they uh, they have a weaker case, then they might wish to have a seat which is uh, in a more volatile jurisdiction. But I think apart from the seat of the arbitration itself, uh, which uh, arbitral rule governing the uh, arbitration matters, for example, whether it's an exit arbitration or an unsitral arbitration also matters when it comes to setting aside an award, because if it's an unsitral arbitration, then the setting aside procedure is the same as that of a commercial arbitration. You go to the seat in that national court. But for exit, it's a bit different in that a, the exit would, uh, would sort of constitute an ad hoc committee to set aside uh, the award. So it's not a sort of based or grounded in any particular jurisdiction. And if you, if you ask me about it, I would think that an exit uh, setting aside uh, committee uh, statistically has a higher uh, percentage of setting aside an award as compared to a award which is seated in more of the safe jurisdiction. So again, those are considerations that uh, parties might want to have. 
Okay, that that that's that could be a bit surprising actually that that exit that maybe an arbitration on exit is more likely to be successfully challenged than, than in a commercial arbitration. So that is that is very interesting. So now, in the interest of time, uh, maybe a few concluding remarks. Uh, Gökce, from a institutional perspective or from HKIC, uh, what uh, what do you think? What what should be improved uh, uh, when we go further with the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, what what would you wish? Well, the first thing actually we should mention is the intermeasure arrangement that, that we already solved its impact of. Uh, we have so far registered 37 intermeasure applications and the mainland Chinese courts already granted 1.6 billion USD. And under the arrangements, uh, the parties can also apply uh, ex parte, so without notice being given to the other party. And we've seen 70% of the applicants are from foreign jurisdictions. This is an important feature of Hong Kong, uh, which should be considered when dealing with BRI projects. The second thing that I would like to mention that should be improved is uh, the diversity of arbitrators, of course. Um, this is a project involving more than 120 jurisdictions and uh, there will be many governing laws and seat of arbitrations. In order to deal with these disputes in a cost and time efficient way and avoid any conflicts, we need experienced practitioners from all around the world and harmonize more international arbitration. In our cases, for example, involving BRI uh, jurisdictions, we see arbitrators from South Africa, Sweden, Malaysia, UK, USA, France, Hong Kong, and mainland China, and represent 32 jurisdictions. At the same time, uh, the project includes many low-income countries. Arbitration may be costly for entities from those jurisdictions. For example, we provide free hearing space uh, for parties from the OECD's DAC list, which covers quite a number of BRI jurisdictions. And this is also another relief that institutions may consider to improve. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, from the Turkish perspective, Zelda and Burke, do you have any, any wish for the future? A little, like just a few words, not to take your time so much. Uh, if you take this uh, opportunity well, uh, I think it would be a big advantage for the market, especially for the consultancy and arbitration cases. And also, as, like Dr. Demikol said, it can modernize the laws and the court decisions. It can change their approach uh, to the arbitration. So I believe it's going to be a big opportunity for both Turkish and the other countries' um, markets, both investment and arbitration uh, markets. Yeah, I, I agree, actually. Yeah. Um, um, well, I, I don't have many points to add, actually, uh, to this, to uh, Gökçe's and Selda's uh, remarks. They, they were wonderful. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I hope, like, that, that I think uh, my understanding is that, like, both, uh, both countries, China and Turkey, uh, really uh, provided some good mechanisms uh, in di for different aspects of arbitration. Like uh, I, I was quite uh, surprised uh, with with Stella's points on uh, on the enforcement regime in China, and that that's really an excellent uh, mechanism. Um, but as as I, I I also see that like both countries uh, need some more. Uh, modernization or some further discussions to uh, to even develop a bit more uh, their arbitration mechanism. And I think at the end of the day, uh, both system will be quite arbitration friendly in that sense. Right, right, I think this is an interesting point. You know, the, the policy is easy to make, for instance, the, the foreign uh, public policy Belt and Road Initiative, but uh, to think about the disputes, how disputes should resolve that often is not the first priority, but in our view, I think that that should be more uh, given consideration to. So um, it was a real pleasure um, to, to hear your thoughts and, and to have uh, this discussion with all of you. 
And uh, as I think we, we came to an end and now the networking is, is uh, session is waiting for us. So what I understand is that we have all to log out here uh, of this Zoom meeting and then enter with the other link to the networking. So um, I wish everyone um, a happy Chinese New Year and I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.